Hi everybody, this is Kate Haley with Glazer's Camera here in Seattle. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. It's our second live session with Panasonic Lumix. Uh, we're going to talk about and have a conversation about whether you're a full frame or a micro four thirds shooter. But before we get to that, just a couple of quick announcements. If you signed up for this session, you're going to receive a little follow-up note with some special promos that actually expire today. So it's like jump on those offers, take advantage of them because they're going to end today. If you haven't signed up yet, please go check that little sign up box and make sure you get that note. It will go out shortly after we wrap this live session today. I also want to mention that today is the last day of our lighting week. So there are some special promos in store available. I can't tell you what they are because they're super secret. We can't like even announce them anywhere. So it's like really quiet. So you have to come in, take advantage of those offers or give the store a call, find out what the deals are. And uh, hopefully you could take advantage of those because there's some really great, amazing offers, but they're all expiring today. So don't delay, get some new lighting, buy a new Panasonic camera or lens, you know. Anyhow, so um, during this session, this is really a more of a conversation. So we wanna hear from you. Please post your questions in the comments on YouTube or on Facebook so that we can bring those questions into the conversation as we move through this presentation. We have Mark Toll and Michael Richardson who are going to be leading this conversation. They're gonna talk about the pluses, the pros and the cons between full frame or micro four thirds cameras to help you decide you know, which camera might be best for you. So whether you have an older camera, you've been thinking about upgrading, or maybe you're taking photos with your phone and you're ready to buy a new camera, like this will be a great conversation to join and listen in on. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Mark Toll first, um, and then um, Mark, perhaps you could introduce Michael after that. So just tell exactly. us a little bit about you, and then we can dive into the presentation and conversation. Okay, well, hopefully some of the people on watching know me from coming to Glazers. Uh, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I'm the uh, manager of the technical rep team at Panasonic. So Michael and I are both technical specialists. We're not so much salespeople. We're supposed to know everything about these cameras. And we're both distinctly different shooters. I'm going to introduce Michael here in a second, but just a background on me. I was a professional photographer, spent my life, spent my whole life and career in photography. And um, I like smaller cameras. So I'm the G person in this, in this conversation. And uh, even though I used to use full frame cameras and I still use some of ours and Michael, who I'm going to introduce, Michael, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah. Michael, do you want to describe your background and why, why you're an S person? <laughs> exact opposite of Mr. Toll. I am the S photographer. I am the guy carrying the full frame, usually rolling with uh, a full case, a full Pelican case of lenses, you name it. I usually have it with me, whether it's in the car or on my back or rolling around. So I work a little bit different than Mark. We had a class earlier today. Uh, we kind of talked about how he likes to use his camera in single shot mode. I like to use my camera in continuous mode. We are complete opposites in a way. So I am the S of today and Mr. Toll is definitely the G. Exactly. So uh, let me start sharing our presentation. And we, it's a presentation, but we're also going to both bring our opinions in here. So are you ready to start sharing screen, Kate? Uh, yeah, let's do that. And then, um, Mark, just a quick note. It looks like the video is coming in from maybe your computer screen and not the camera you have set up. So just uh, so you know it, uh, where your video seems to be coming in from on us. I know. I saw that. It looks It yeah. looked, It looks. looks fine. I'm, yeah, I know what you yeah, mean. You were, I'll, yeah, I'll, you were I'll, looking I'll probably at luckily, the camera that's like here, but I just wanted to let yeah. you know before we went further. I appreciate that. Luckily, we'll be uh, looking more at uh, pictures and yeah, slides. Yeah, we have me, slides, so. so we're good. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so again, just, just a little basic in case anybody's tuning in wondering what a Lumix G or a Lumix S is. So a uh, Lumix G camera has a micro four thirds. It's a four thirds sensor. And um, that we've been making these for oh God, 10 years now. I've been shooting with them since the very beginning. Oh, let me make sure we're okay here. So my volume is up and everything. Um, and the Lumix S is our full frame camera. So the difference in these two sensors, there's very little difference in the cameras themselves. The difference in the sensors is a full frame sensor is four times bigger than a Lumix G sensor for third sensor, which makes the camera bigger and a lot of other things. So we're gonna describe those differences and why you would use one over the other, why you might wanna choose one or the other. 
Um, again, we've been making G series cameras and the S's are new. Full frame has become sort of, uh, it's gaining a lot of popularity, but I believe strongly that there's a good reason to use the S cameras. So Michael Richardson can, ex can talk a little bit about uh, his type of photography. So a lot of what I did for 25 years, I've been in the photo industry for a very, very long time. I won't say when I started, but uh, my beautiful adage of this is I've been in either the retail or the shooting on or the uh, rep area of the photo industry. So either I've swept around it, priced it, sold it, repped it, shot it, you name it, I've done it. So uh, what I used to do for 25 years, I ran my own commercial studio here in Torrance, California, photographing everything from uh, tiny microchips for F-16 fighter aircraft all the way up to helicopters and large uh, ships, you name it. I pretty much shot it in between. But what I do for fun, as you can see in my images here, I like to go out and shoot NCAA football. So I am from the Los Angeles area, so I am a Trojan fan. And you can see last year I was up and got the fun ability to come up to the Washington game up in your area and shoot the game with a 47 megapixel S1R, the top picture GH5S. So I do do a little bit of G work as well as S, but lately I shoot more S than G, but we'll talk about that as we move forward. Exactly. Thanks, Michael. So um, I want to talk about a couple of features that are, that, are, that are unique to Panasonic cameras, and these are in all of the cameras that we're talking about. We're not going to talk a lot about individual cameras. We are going to give a few slides on them and, and explain to you what the differences are. Um, one feature that I, th I really love on our cameras is what's called 4K, 6K photo mode. So an example of this is these two pictures that I took. We're going to show a video in a second here of the skateboarder and the woman um, flipping her hair out of the water here. So the idea behind this is you were able to take a 4K video in our camera. And all of our cameras do this from the, the smallest point and shoot up to the, to the 47 megapixel um, S1R. Then you're able to pull an individual frame out of it. So in, a, in both of these scenes where the woman is flipping her hair out of the water, I just held the button down while she was flipping her hair out of the water. And then I went through frame by frame and pulled a frame out of it, which a lot of photographers think is cheating, but I, I got the picture. So um, uh, Kate, can you uh, play the video of the skateboarder picture, which I pulled this frame out of? Yeah, Devin will be queuing those up for you, and here it goes. Okay, there we go. So you can see this, I was in uh, Santa Monica, down near where Michael lives, and I was shooting skateboarding, which I don't know if you've ever shot it, but it's extremely hard to get a good picture. After a, a couple hundred still shots, I decided to take a video and you'll see where he comes back around here and he goes right up here, right there. I pulled the frame out that is on the slide. So you can stop the video, uh, um, Devin. And you can, you can see, I went through the back of it. You can do this on the back of the camera and I pulled an individual frame out, which because uh, this was a 4K, it'll make up to an 11 by 14 inch print, but our cameras that have 20 megapixel sensors or our full frame cameras can pull an 18 megapixel still file out of that video. So it just gives you more. Uh, and this is, this is other cameras do this, but we do it in the camera where they tend not to do it using the touch screen. So you can do all of this in the camera, transfer it to your phone and post it on, uh, on YouTube, like I do, or not YouTube, but uh, I'm sorry, we're on YouTube, um, Facebook and uh, uh, Instagram. Uh, another feature I really love is time lapse. And again, every camera from the smallest point and shoot to the most expensive uh, full frame camera. Everybody knows what time lapse is. This is where you record a series of still pictures over a period of time and then play it back. It basically condenses time. Now, the thing that's unique about this in Panasonic cameras that most cameras don't do is while you're shooting the, the, the sequence, like this one here I shot of the Reno sunset, uh, let's go ahead and show it, uh, Devin. Okay, so as I shot this, I was sitting in a chair. The camera's on a tripod next to me. It's shooting a picture every 10 seconds for two hours during the sunset. Now, the neat thing about the Panasonic camera, again, a lot of cameras will do this, is I can easily set up my interval and how long I want it to shoot and how many I want it to shoot. But when it's done, I look up at the camera and it says, do you want to make a video out of this? And all I do is press yes. It takes about a minute and it creates a video in the camera. And unlike I've learned from some other cameras, 
it also saves all the frames. So if I've got this set to shoot high resolution stills, each of these is a frame that I could pull and, and get a great sunset picture from, from sitting on the porch there in Reno. So again, all of our cameras. Okay, Devin, look, we're gonna go on to the next one. Mark, what I really love about that camera, that feature is that yeah. not does it show you when it's gonna start, you can tell it to start, you can delay it, but it also tells you when it's gonna stop. So when you're setting up the original, say 300 images and, an, and a, a time sequence in between each image, the camera will literally tell you it's gonna finish at 635 and you can say, oh, sunset's not that late or I need a longer time period. Go in and make your choices. It's so intuitive and so easy to do. Exactly. And under this mode too, there's also a, um, uh, what do I want to, uh, stop motion animation. So if you want to actually have it pause for each frame while you, let's say you put a Lego together or something like that, it'll do that. Um, Wi-Fi, Michael and I both love this. So um, I've, I've Wi-Fi to me is the greatest feature because is, is Michael, Michael's more of a deliberate photographer. I'm more of a snap it, bring it into to the, to my phone, transfer it to my phone and get it on Instagram and be done with it. Um, and the nice thing about this is, I mean, every camera now has a Wi-Fi. You can control the camera from it. You can shoot pictures from it. You can focus from it. Um, what I do mostly with it is transfer the picture or a 1080p video. So I can shoot a video and transfer it over to my phone and then immediately be online with it. And, 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 and my feeling be done with it. This is when, when, as we go through this, you're going to see this difference in Michael and I. About so, this so Michael, is, I mean, every uh, camera now has a Wi-Fi. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, in sports as well. So uh, if I'm on the football field, like that image that was uh, shot earlier of Sam Darnold uh, at USC, I love that image. He had kind of the Heisman pose going. It was great. All I did was uh, transfer it to my, my smartphone. And then on my smartphone, I transferred it up to the press box without running up there. And within five minutes, it was on Sports Illustrated uh, Internet. And, our, and uh, it was fantastic. We were able to get an image delivered for, of a touchdown within five minutes of uh, it actually happening. Cool advantage to be able to do that with Wi-Fi and smartphones. Exactly. I even used this at a, um, I used this at a wedding where I, I shot the wedding and I don't do much of this. And when we were on our way to the reception, I pulled over, uh, connected this to my phone, grabbed a picture off of the camera that I shot at the wedding, sent it to the bride and her mother. And when we got to the reception, they were already passing the phone around to show the picture. And, and somebody next to me goes, do you, do you, are you available next month to shoot another wedding? <laughs> so, so just, just a phenomenal feature. So I know if, you, if you're a Panasonic person, you're going to go, wait a second, this is not a four-thirds camera. I want to mention two cameras, the, the LX10 and the LX100, because to me, these cameras I use as a counterpart to my G-series or S-series camera. The reason I do this is the LX10 has a one-inch sensor, which is smaller than a, than a, a four-thirds, obviously. But this camera can fit in my jacket pocket, in my pants pocket, in a small bag on my back. And what this does is you'll see the picture on the right there, which I took in a subway in New York. The thing I love about this camera is unlike the larger cameras, I can just lift this camera up in full auto and just snap the picture. And neither one of these guys heard the shutter, knew what I was doing. And I can capture just these really candid scenes where a lot of time, if you're lifting up a, a larger camera, they're going to notice, they're going to look at you, they're, it's going to ruin the, the moment, and they're going to say, don't take my picture, or they're going to pose for you. So uh, I know, let me go to the next one, Michael, because I think you like this one a lot. I tend to carry them both, but this one I definitely carry all the time. Yeah, this is the LX100 mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, again, the nice thing about these is they've got very fast lenses. They're, they're, they don't go very telephoto, so they're mostly wide angle, but they're f1.8. So again, like the picture of the, uh, the steam train up there, that was just lit by some, uh, some spotlights people put on the side. The wagon was on a trip uh, with Panasonic to Puerto Rico where it was extremely hot. And um, I just, it, I was walking a long ways. The first day I took a big camera. The second day, it's like, I'm just taking the LX100. So I carry these cameras again in conjunction. They don't replace the other two, but a lot of times, when let's say I'm going to dinner or I'm, I'm when we used to be able to travel and visit cities, 
either one of these cameras, especially the Dell X100 II, is the one that I would grab to, to take along with me. Now, this is a four-thirds camera, so it is legitimately in this uh, in this discussion, even though it's uh, an LX series, it's not a G series. It uses the same sensor, the 20 megapixel sensor, that the other cameras use. It just, it just um, has a fixed lens, which is why it's not a, a G series camera. So let's talk about micro four thirds, my, my favorites. I fell in love with these cameras when, when I first work, started working for uh, Panasonic. They sent me one of these four thirds cameras and I was, uh, Michael and I, I think you were a Nikon shooter, weren't you before you worked for Panasonic, Michael? I have to say I was a little bit of everything. I used to shoot uh -huh. a ton of Hasselblad. Uh, when digital came in, I started with Nikon. Uh, I had the unfortunate adventure that uh, all my Nikon gear was lost in the, in the transition from United Airlines one day, and I had to start all over. Uh, and so insurance was fantastic. I had a check. Could I buy more Nikon and go back and buy exactly what I wanted? But at the time, Canon went to 16 millimeters, so I shot a ton of Canon. But then when I started with Panasonic, I really thought uh, I would still continue shooting my Canon gear. Panasonic never told me that I had to shoot Panasonic. But I'll be very honest with you, once I began using the cameras and using all the features and seeing how much better my images were, uh, I even had customers say to me uh, when I first transitioned over, I didn't say anything, but uh, they would you know, send me an email or call me up and go, what are you doing differently? So that was like probably the greatest thing I could ever hear uh, was that my images to them once I started shooting Panasonic was looking much better. And so then I just basically switched everything over to Panasonic. Yeah, I agree. When I when they first sent me, I, I was here when the first G1 came out and they sent me this little camera. And to be honest with you, I was an icon shooter for, for years and years. And I looked at this little camera and I thought, why are we getting into this business? You know, this is this is crazy. And I because I worked for Panasonic, I went out and shot with it. And about three months later, I took all my Nikon stuff down to the store and sold it. And, you know, to me, it's the size. I mean, the quality is there for sure, but, and we've got all these lenses and we can talk about all these great, um, you know, what the sensor does and how many megapixels it has. But, you know, to be honest with you, most cameras have, have that. They're not, there's not a lot of difference in some cameras these days, but the size of it, it's, it, it became a camera that I, that I carried with me all the time. And that's again, probably why I like, it is why I like the G series the best because it's always, um, I always have one in the trunk. Um, when I leave the house, I grab one and take it with me. And I don't necessarily with the S, but Michael will talk to you about why he does. <laughs> um, another one of the, the best thing about all these Panasonic cameras we're talking about, the Gs and the Ss, is dual stabilization. Again, this is one of those things that just makes your life so much easier. You know, this looks like a technical slide, so I'm not gonna go over every feature. What this basically does is lets me shoot at a lot lower shutter speed. One of the drawbacks to the G series, which is why I will occasionally use the S, is you can't go very high in ISO. So low light shooting is a little tough with a crop sensor camera. But because I've got all this stabilization, I can shoot at a lower shutter speed. So if I am, let's say downtown at night, and you know no, nothing's moving in the scene, I can go down to a tenth of a second. Uh, yeah, I've even handheld it down to a half a second, which makes up for that not being able to go as high in the ISO. But that is one of the things we're, that we're going to talk about is um, if you're a low light shooter, then that's the reason I take the S out um, instead of the G. So uh, Michael, do you, have any, do you have any comment on this? Or I totally agree with you. And I think one of the things that uh, we talked about transitioning from other manufacturers to uh, Panasonic and Lumix. When I first went out and shot my first football game, USC with uh, a GH5 and a 100 to 400, there, everybody had been used to seeing me out there with my Canon gear, my giant 400 millimeter 2.8 lens, two lens, my giant gear, you know, two bodies. I'm probably carrying 40 to 50 pounds of camera, a monopod, all those things. And now I'm out shooting with this, what they called a toy. I got a lot of heat that first, first day. And I said to myself, I'm going to shoot the first quarter with GH5, and then I'll shoot the second quarter with my Canon gear. And then at halftime, when I get a chance to look at things, I'll make the decision. Well, after hearing everybody give me a hard time during the whole first quarter, what's that? What are you using? That's a toy. I said, okay, fine. Meet me in the press box. 
at halftime and we'll talk about it. And that was very impressive because I got through the first quarter and I felt that I was getting more images and better quality already at first quarter. So I decided to shoot all the way through to the second quarter with GH5 and a 100 to 400. We got to halftime and I started downloading my images. And the next thing I know, which is very unusual because everybody's got a tight time. Everybody's at their laptop. Everybody's working hard. But all of a sudden, I had a crowd of five or ten guys looking over my shoulder, wondering what I got. By the end of halftime, after they saw me do my edits and run out, they're asking me, can I borrow your camera? That says everything. They don't want to carry all that heavy gear anymore. Uh, and so be able to walk around on a field without a monopod, 100 to 400, a GH5 with an extra battery grip, and get more consistent quality, even though I'm using a smaller crop sensor, is fantastic. And then you'll see later today when we talk about S-Series, why I'm going the exact opposite at times and carrying not only a full frame camera, but now shooting with 47 megapixels, which most people would say, if I'm a sports shooter, that's ridiculous. But I'll show you why I like to do that. Thanks. So let's let's talk about a couple of the cameras. One of the, and I'm, I'm sort of concentrating on the ones I've used the most. The GX85 was a camera that, um, that I use, and I still and I still do use this um, almost all the time. This is the one that's always in the car with me. You can see it's compact size. It's this, it's not much bigger than a point and shoot camera. It's got a collapsible lens, so when that lens is collapsed. But what I like about this camera is is these two pictures. So that's my granddaughter in the upper right there. We were going out for Halloween, and I've I want to be able to you know help them carry candy. I want to be able to, I don't want the camera to be in the way, but my son is tying her um, cape on. And I just lifted that camera up, shot the picture, the image stabilization again. I didn't worry about the shutter speed. This is just with the little kit lens. And it lets me carry, capture these pictures so that even when we go out, then I'm walking around for Halloween and my, she wants to hold my hand and, and she wants to use the camera. She loves to use this camera. I've just got it on my wrist and I can just swing it up or I can slip it in my jacket pocket. Um, the other one was at a street festival here in Alberta. And, um, and I, I, always, I like this one because I, I always got the feeling this guy might've been smoking a little something before I took this picture that uh, I just loved it. But again, I saw this, there was a guy blowing bubbles and again, I saw this, I turned around, saw the bubble. I'm, and as Michael explained, I'm not a person who stands there and takes a lot of pictures. Uh, I turn around, I see this guy blowing bubbles. I lift the camera. I shoot two or three pictures and um, I'm down the street shooting more pictures. That's where, again, Michael and I are very, very different. But the GX85, you know, it's got a little tilting LCD. It'll, it, all these cameras do 4K video. So if I want to shoot video, um, I can just push the red button or go into the uh, video mode. And they all have the stabilization. So I don't have to worry about that as it gets dark. Um, again, we talked about stabilization. Um, you know, the sensors that have, you know, this has a 16 megapixel sensor, uh, which I've made 20 by 30s from, 20 by 30 inch prints. I spent a lot of time in the photo finishing business. So I actually still make prints. Um, but if I can make a 20 by 30 from this camera, and that's how mostly when I've showed it to people, and again, I run into the same thing Michael does, which is people look at you like, oh, it's too bad you don't have a real camera. And I'll show them the picture, like when I'm in an event at Glazer's, I'll bring a 20 by 30 and say, I took this with this camera, you know, and just walking down the street. So um, this is another, this, this has actually become my replacement for it. And the reason is, is the GX100 was introduced in July. The GX100 is, is the same size as the uh, GX85. It's the same exact size as this camera. And it, but it's got a, a um, oh, what do you call it? Articulating uh, LCD screen or, or swivel screen or flippy screen as somebody calls it online. And I, I like this because it gives me the chance to hold the camera lower or higher. And this camera is meant for um, the vlogger, the person who wants to make videos for YouTube and become or TikTok and become a famous um, vlogger. And I'm not going to, at my age, I'm not going to become a famous vlogger, but it's getting me more into video. You can see the little tripod I hold it with, which lets me trigger um, the shutter or the, um, uh, or video from that. 
And it's also got a phenomenal microphone that uh, gives you great audio. We're going to play a little video here. Devin, can you play the video? Of, uh, so today we're going to try kayak vlogging with the uh, G100. And this is the uh, eight millimeter lens to give you a, a view down the river here. And uh, anyways, I'm out this morning. It's this beautiful Sunday morning. It's very calm. I'm on the Willamette River near, uh, near West Lynn, just south of Portland, Oregon. And so the thing I love about this camera is that I can just do a quick um, video like that by, by turning that little screen around. I can see myself in it. When I do that, the camera automatically goes into the face detection mode. It points this microphone at me, this, this Nokia microphone, which knows where you're talking to it from. And so again, you know, but, but if, you, if people, if somebody were to ask me, what's your favorite feature about this camera? It's the size. Um, years ago, we made a GM one and five that were the smallest interchangeable lens cameras you could buy. They were about the size of a cell phone and they were almost a little too small for me. So this one's got a little bit of a grip. Um, and again, this, this has become my new favorite camera. Um, Michael, do you want to uh, talk about some of the, these features with the video? Sure. G100 is another camera that has made it into my bag and pretty much uh, like Mark, I always carry a camera wherever I go. Uh, before G100, it was LX100 Mark II, which we talked about. And I always throw in my wife's bag if we're going somewhere with the family. Uh, it's the LX10. Uh, going to a concert event and I need long telephoto, it's ZS200. Uh, so those were kind of my three go-tos. But uh, I'll be honest with you, G100 has made my way. Along with Mark, I am more of a still shooter but I'm taking more and more videos and this camera has made me do it because it makes it so much easier. One of the great features is a new feature called record frame indicator you'll notice on the left. So that rather than when you record generally like on a GH5, you get this little red dot up in the top that is basically the tally light that tells you you are recording. Now the whole frame lights up as well as that little light. You can turn that on and off. I like it on all the time. It makes it very easy to know whether you are recording especially if you're doing kind of a selfie vlog. Uh, we've got built-in frame markers now for a variety of different uh, frame aspects. So whether you're shooting CinemaScope or uh, regular 16 by nine, or if you're a Instagrammer or Facebooker or need vertical video, this gives you the four, three, the five, four, the one, one, the four, five, you name it, they're all built in. You can designate a color, you can designate an amount of shading uh, for masking out which area is not being video. And then remember that if you do shoot this camera video, it automatically, it's the second camera in our line to do so. And when you was the first, now there's another one. Uh, that's the S5 we'll talk about later. But G100, if you vertical shoot your video in vertical format, it automatically senses that, automatically tags your video for vertical, and will automatically transfer it to your smartphone in vertical, vertical format as well as if you want to edit. A very, very great camera, super small, super lightweight, but feature rich. That's the things about Panasonic that I think has drawn me to it uh, and making the, me, me use their cameras a lot is all the features from like what Mark talked about, uh, time-lapse to post-focus to video features that are so easy to now taking vertical video, transferring it already ready to go into a vertical format for Instagram or TikTok, whichever you're doing. And again, the, the, the reason, you know, people ask, why did you put this in? Why did you make this vlogging camera a four thirds? Why is it a smaller sensor? And, and there's, a, there's kind of a current belief that you have to do everything in full frame, including video. But a lot of video is better on the smaller sensor for a couple of reasons. One is depth of field. It's more forgiving of depth of field. It, it doesn't have as much trouble focusing and you get more in focus in your background. Um, also, obviously, the smaller camera, but for, the, for what most people are using video for, which is YouTube and Vimeo and Instagram and, all, and Facebook, this is actually overkill. This is even more than you need. If you, if you put this on video in 4K, it looks phenomenal on a TV, but with most people watching these on a um, tablet or a phone, the four-thirds sensor is perfect for this, and, and you get the small camera. That theme keeps coming up, doesn't it? <laughs> um, let's just go over a couple other models real quick. So up from there is the G85. The G85 is basically a GX85 with a viewfinder and a more conventional shape. Um, it has things like a microphone jack if you're a video person. 
Um, a microphone jack is very handy. Uh, the G100 has one, but the GX85 doesn't. Um, again, all these are all four thirds cameras. The G95, which is a 20 megapixel version of the um, um, G85. And again, um, here's, a, here's a low light scene I shot. And a lot of the reason that Michael and I show these pictures and we bring prints of these pictures to show is you still get people who come in and go, um, gee, I, you know, I would never use a small sensor, crop sensor camera, even APS-C. Um, they, they feel that full frame is just the way to go. And again, for the convenience of it, and when they see a 20 by 30 print from this, their first reaction is, I never print anything that big if I print anything at all. And they see the quality. So even if you're a full frame shooter, a lot of full frame shooters still carry a crop sensor camera like a four thirds. Michael and I have both sold them to a lot of Nikon, Canon, Sony owners who want something small to carry when they're you know, going to dinner, traveling, uh, you know, just, just going on a hike and they don't want to carry this, this camera with these really big lenses. Yeah. Uh, and again, the dual IS, we just can't say enough about that because it, your pictures are going to be so much sharper. Um, the G95 uh, does have a, a weather, weather resistant body, which we'll talk about, which in the Northwest, it's not necessary, but it's really great. That doesn't mean you can't. I use all of our cameras in, in the Northwest here in Portland. I try not to get them wet, but keep in mind that the ones that are sealed are, are a little more water resistant. So um, Michael, do you wanna describe the G? This is where the cameras start to get a little bit bigger. In fact, the G9 is the same size as our new S5, as you'll see later on. Michael is a big fan of the G9. It, it's funny, this camera, I love the quality from it. It's a little more of a professional camera, but it crossed the line a little bit for me in size. Uh, but again, it's a very small camera, as is the S5. Michael, but you've used this one a lot. I use G9 a lot. It's a little bit, I think just slightly wider than uh, GH5. But what I like about this camera is it was designed as a stills camera for professional use uh, from the main amazing image stabilization. So we talked about image stabilization just a slide ago, and I just want to add to that. Um, you know, most people think of image stabilization as just for video. So as you're panning or walking with the camera, rather than using a gimbal, the image stabilization is making that image so nice and smooth as you're shooting video. But I have to add, I rely on image stabilization a ton as a still photographer. So in low light situations now where I maybe only was limited to an eighth of a second, now I'm down to a half a second because image stabilization will allow me to hand hold that camera and make it a nice stable body. Even though I've got a little bit of shake going on, it's going to stabilize me and take care of that. This camera's got six and a half stops of image stabilization, a little bit more than GH5, uh, an amazing ergonomic body with a grip, LCD screen on top that gives you all the information you really need at a very, very simple glance, very lightweight, uh, has a sensor, 20 megapixels, uh, without a low pass filter. So is extremely, extremely sharp. Uh, and the other thing about this camera that's a little different is it actually has a coating on the sensor for reflectivity. So if you are shooting say nights or things with low light where there's a lot of bright pinpoint light areas, they are reduced quite a bit by the coating that is on the sensor of this camera. Headphone jack, if you're a video shooter, 4K video, uh, it's recently got firmware upgrades that we are uh, world renowned for of improving cameras. So now this camera originally did not have vlog capabilities. Now it does if you want to purchase the vlog for it. Uh, just tremendous to tremendous amount of features in a dust proof, splash proof, small, lightweight, 20 megapixel, uh, very easy to carry body. But the exciting thing is, as much as I've gotten used to G9, the first day when I got my S5 that came through, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit real fast. The S5 is about the same size, actually just a slight bit smaller. So I've been confusing the two while they're sitting on the kitchen counter and I'm running out to grab a camera to go to the car. I get out to the car and I'm thinking I got an S5 in my hand and I have to look down and go, oh wait, I got the G9, go back in. It's kind of been a joke around my house. My wife now says when I go out the door, make sure you got the right camera. Exactly. And so that leads us on to the, to the last of the, I'll just go through, these are just explaining the features where we just want to make sure we get to the S series here. <laughs> the GH5. So the GH5, the, if you're thinking about buying a four thirds camera, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, if you're, you're thinking about buying a four, a four thirds Lumix camera, 
the difference between the GH5 and the G9 is the GH5 has the same sensor. Well, in fact, you know, a good thing, uh, one question we get in stores when, when we used to come to the stores and talk to customers is, oh, what's going to give me the better picture, the GX85, the G85, the G9, or the GH5? In a lot of ways, they're all going to give you the same picture. They're going to give you the same image. They're going to do things like they're going to shoot a faster burst. Um, they're going to have maybe a more rugged body. They're going to um, maybe do a little bit better, higher ISO, but the sensors don't change. It's going to be the features of the camera that you're looking for. And a lot of times the design of the camera, you know, people will ask me if they're looking at a G9 and they'll say, gee, that, that feels too big. I was hoping for something more like uh, of something I could put in my pocket. I show them the GX85. And if I show them pictures from both of them, you can't tell. And so if you don't need fast burst, um, faster, um, high, uh, let's say slow motion video, microphones, things like that, it's not a quality, it's not an image quality choice, it's a feature choice in cameras. But again, this camera is very much like um, the G9. Think of this as uh, if you're a video shooter and if you wanna become a videographer, TV shows are shot with this, movies have been shot with this. If you're primarily video, but some stills, the GH5 is the camera for you. If you're primarily stills and some video, the G9 is good for you. Although again, the video will look exactly the same. The GH5 will just give you um, some more settings that, that videographers like, um, things like vector scopes, things that we don't need to go into here that, that really make video amazing. So Michael, <laughs> these are now the S5 has become one of my favorites, but but I'm gonna I'm gonna let you know you've you've spent a lot more time with these cameras than I have. Jump into that. Go back one slide for me. Oh sure. Mm -hmm. Just want to push if you are a video shooter or you're video centric, I like to call this camera a hybrid. Uh, it's a fantastic stills camera. I mentioned that I even use it for uh, my professional work for sports, and I use it for my professional work for a variety of things. Um, it's, an, it's an amazing beast of a camera it's for a micro four thirds. Um, but if you are definitely a video shooter, the capabilities of this camera until recently are second to none. 10 bit 422 uh, recording, uh, anamorphic, uh, 6K captures, a variety of different things. Uh, you can do 6K video in the uh, 4K, 6K photo mode, uh, a variety of different things, but its main capture is 4K but you have that 10-bit 422 color. You also have all intra codec. So if you're a video person, that means that each and every frame is its individual frame. It will edit better. It will edit a little faster and give you much sharper details. Disadvantage being you need a very, very fast card for that type of codec, but it is possible with this camera. It is a professional camera uh, in a very, very small form factor. And that's the beauty of S5. Let's move forward, or sorry, the beauty of GH5. But let's yeah. move forward. The S, because we're going to talk about the S family. And I'm going to start with, with the biggest brother of them all, and that's the S1H. That is your cinema beast, as I love to call that camera. It is full frame. It is the only uh, form factor of this nature that is approved for Netflix certified production. Uh, dual native ISO. I'm going to talk about that as we move along. 4K60 internal. 6K internal at 24p 10 bit, unlimited recording time. That's right, unlimited recording time. That's one thing I'm going to hit home because if you've been listening, well, that's, that's another benefit of the GH5 too. And uh, yeah. back to GH5. In fact, that's a benefit of pretty much a majority of all the cameras that are in the Panasonic line. They record 30 minute clips or greater. GH5 unlimited. S1H unlimited. S8, S5, unlimited in most except 10-bit. Um, you'll be noticing that you'll be hearing a lot of things out there with other cameras that have been released lately that you're only getting 20 minutes and then you can't go back and shoot. I'm going to stop at that. I'm not going to badmouth anybody else, but I'm just going to say the ability for these cameras, even when they do have a 30-minute limit like an S5, you can do that 30-minute clip at 10-bit 422, 4K, and then start right again and get going. It's not going to have any overheating problems. Those things are what everybody else is trying to copy or uh, improve from Panasonic and haven't been able to do so and keeps us set apart from the rest. Unlimited recording time, 10-bit 422 recording if you're a video person, um, and a variety, a variety of other things. 
uh, 14 stops of V-Log on this S1H, which is like our very cams, the huge professional cameras. Now that is our video beast. So if you are a video shooter and you need to step up higher than GH5, S1H is the top of the line. S1R is that kind of like the G9 in the S series. I consider that the camera for the still shooter. It's probably my favorite in the line is S1R. It's 47 megapixels. It also has 187 megapixel high res mode. Uh, the beauty on all the viewfinders on the S series and the S1, S1R and S1H is you've got five plus million dots in the viewfinder. The viewfinder is beautiful. S5 is a lower resolution, but S1, S1R and S1H is amazing. So if you're making that transition from say a DSLR based camera with a mirror box and you're making your first transition to the mirrorless, maybe you've tried GH5 before and you're not really happy with how the viewfinder looks, you will feel completely different with an S series body. Uh, seven stops of five axis dual IS. That's right, I said seven stops. Amazing ability for dual native ISO or dual IS on this. If you've got uh, image stabilization in body and image stabilization in lens. And then the ultimate hybrid S1, uh, the, the little guy of the family, I guess, until we released the S5. S1, an amazing 24 megapixels, 96 megapixel high res mode, that beautiful 5 million plus viewfinder, seven stops of dual native or dual IS image stabilization. Beautiful, beautiful camera, does great job. You can upgrade it to its filmmaker kit uh, and add vlog. So it is also a video beast. And now I'm gonna to get to the S5, just recently introduced here uh, and now shipping to most places. It's been very, very popular for us. Um, it is the size of a G9, whereas S1H, S1R and S1 are pretty big cameras. I'll be honest with you, I hurt my back about a year and a half ago. And when the S series came out, I picked up that camera and I had trouble with it because it was pretty heavy. Uh, so I had to rebuild my strength. But now S5 is the same, actually lighter than a GH5, smaller than a GH5, but packs that same full frame sensor in the rest of the cameras that are 24 megapixels. Again, it has dual native ISO. We'll talk about that more. 4K 60 10 bit, 4K 38 bit unlimited recording time, 14 plus stops with a full V-log, not a limited V-log like we get on the micro four thirds sensors, a full 14 stop V-log for that film production quality. Amazing, amazing cameras and an amazing family that does fantastic work in a full frame society, full frame work. Yeah, and, and if you're looking for more information on the S5 um, and you're watching on Glazer's uh, uh, YouTube site, you'll notice that uh, two days ago, Sean Robinson and I did from Panasonic did a specific um, one of these uh, classes on the S5. So there's an hour's worth of full details because we won't be able to go into all those details here. But look that up on, uh, on Glazer's YouTube site. What I like to call the S5 is a transitional camera because it is a fantastic camera if you've been a GH5 shooter or you're a micro four third shooter and you've been thinking about transferring to full frame. I consider it a beautiful, beautiful camera to make that transition. So we talk about sports now. We'll get back to S5 in a little bit. I like to shoot sports and this was my attempt Usually I get challenged by people that tell me, oh, you can't do this with a micro four thirds or you can't do that with full frame. Well, the challenge was you would never shoot sports with a 47 megapixel sensor, would you? Well, guess what? That's what Mike went out and did. So here's a beautiful example of what you can do with 47 megapixels. This is from across the field, 7200 F4, perfect timing with the catch at nine frames per second on the S1R. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that not how great that looks. Well, look how small of an area I actually cropped that from. That is the full frame image. The image that you saw before was what I took from that frame. Still a high res, res image that you could print big and beautiful. Uh, most of my images are delivered on the internet. And so I don't need super high res. So the ability to shoot 47 megapixels. And if I see something all the way across the field, normally I would probably say, Ah, won't worry about it, but with 47 megapixels, I get that ability to crop in. So I'm gonna show you another example of that. Here we see the running back coming around the corner, USC defender, and whoa, that looks great. That's a great shot. Look, even the depth of field dropped out. I'm shooting this wide open at F4 with the 70 to 200. At the time of this game, we did not have the 70 to 200 2.8. 
that is one of my go-to on the S series. So this is the 70 to 200 on the S1R. And if we go to the next slide, I did the same trick. Here is that same image at 47 megapixels. And the beauty of it, what's happening on the right, if you'll notice, it's kind of blacked out. When we shoot on the field, I'm down kneeling on the ground and there's always a ref in your way. So that's the ref's pant leg there on the left, covering over the right part of my frame. So I'm gonna crop that out anyways. So I might as well take the ability to crop in and get that beautiful look. And so that's again, using 47 megapixels at nine frames per second on the field shooting football. What a great way to do it. And one difference between the G and S series cameras, which makes the full frame better for sports is you get um, more uh, shallow depth of field with a full frame camera. So like in this picture, you'll see that they're separated from the background beautifully, where if this was a four thirds or a crop sensor, the background would be more in focus. So again, this is a situation, I don't, I don't shoot this type of, of, of photography, but if I did, I would probably use the full frame camera for this. And that's, oh, so again, here's using 100 or 200, 70 to 200 at F4, 47 megapixels. Just amazing, great capture. And most people would say that that would be too slow of a camera for using sports. But as you can see by looking at the three images that we just showed you, uh, I proved it wrong. So, and one thing, you'll, one thing you'll get in full frame too is the detail you see in his hand and the ball and the helmet. And you'll, you'll get more resolution like that in a, in a professional situation like this. Logo on his left shoulder. And it would be yeah. ridiculous as well as pretty much anything else. Um, right. Beauty of uh, full frame as well as what I like about full frame is the dynamic range from shadow to highlight as well as low light capabilities. Of course, this is not a situation for low light. This was uh, a very uh, nice kind of overcast day up in the Washington area by you guys. I'll be honest with you, for uh, the California boy that I am, it was cold. <laughs> it was 50 degrees. I was freezing. But that's me. I'm a California boy. I'm not used to that 50 degree weather, but uh, had no problem. It was a great day. Let's move on. So there is a current lineup of amazing lenses for S-Series. We are a member of the L-Mount Alliance, which includes the following. Sigma and that small company that everybody's heard of called Leica. <laughs> Leica makes some of the best glass in the world. We have been partners with Leica for pretty much, I think, on pretty much our entire time of being uh, manufacturers of mirrorless cameras. You'll notice that a lot of our G-Series lenses are monikered Leica branded. Uh, they actually assist us with design, construction, uh, QC, all that kind of stuff. So we have glass in our line for G-Series that is Leica certified. It actually carries the Leica name. And in the S-Series, that carries on. A majority of our lenses are Lumix brand and Leica certified. Because we share a mount, you're not going to see the Leica name on the front of the lens. But if you uh, want to put that Leica Sumicron or that six or $7,000 Leica piece of glass on your S1R or your S1H or your S1 or your S5, you can do so because we now use the same mount. And of course, Sigma is also making a wide variety of lenses in the L mount as well. So we are all this one alliance together. Now, the beautiful thing is what's coming. So if you'll notice on the bottom in the middle, you'll see the S5, our new camera. And then there are also four new primes that are on their way. And uh, that is, I'm going to announce those if you haven't heard of them yet. They're all 1.8 glass. They are all in the same form factor. So they basically all look the same size and shape. And they are in the following focal lengths. 20 millimeter, I'm sorry, 24. Let's correct that. 24 millimeter, 1.8. 35 millimeter, 1.8. 50 millimeter, 1.8. And 85 millimeter, 1.8. You'll be seeing the 85 millimeter 1.8 before the end of the year and the other three lenses in the wider variety closer toward uh, the beginning of the following 2021. Uh, 20 to 60 is the next lens over. That is the uh, new quote kit lens on the S5. I've been shooting it a lot. I hate to call that a kit lens, just like I hate to call the S5 an entry level camera. It is so feature rich. If you watch that uh, our video that Mark mentioned with he and Sean on, the S5 is an incredibly feature-rich camera, including things like dual native ISO, uh, great frame rates and codecs for video quality, uh, V-Log included, a full V-Log just like in S1H, so I tend to call it the S1H Mini or the baby brother to the S1H. 
So I like to call it a transitional camera rather than calling it an entry level. And then of course we have a 75 to 300 coming up. You'll also see that in 2021. So our lens line is growing uh, by leaps and bounds as we move through this COVID society and as shipments get produced and, and things get moving a lot quicker, you'll be seeing all those great lenses. All the S bodies have are designed with dust and splash resistance. So like Mark talked about when he's up there in the Portland area, you get a little bit of rain, you get a little bit of snow, uh, if I'm down here in Southern California and out in the desert area, you get a little bit of dust or on a travel to Hawaii, no need to worry. Uh, they are dust and sealed resistance. No, you and this can. This is also, this is also in our G9 and our uh, GH5 and the G9. Several, uh, G95. Yeah. So this, a lot of this goes through our whole line of cameras, not, not all of them, but a lot of them are dust and splash resistant. You will find this ability in, in pretty much most of our mid range to high end uh, professional based cameras. So let's talk about dual native ISO. Yeah. This is the ability of a camera to actually have two ISO ramps. So if you'll remember when you normally set your camera, say to ISO 100 or 400, and then you move to 800, 1600, and 3200, as you get to that 1600, 3200, you notice that the noise increases. Well, that is because we are sending a higher voltage to the sensor to make it more sensitive, to give you that higher ISO. As we add voltage to the sensor, it's just the practice of uh, physics, you get noise. But what we've now created is a sensor that has two separate nodal points or two separate circuits. So now you have one that starts at 400 as a native and goes all the way up and one that starts at 4,000. That gives you the ability to shoot ISO 4,000 as clean as ISO 400. I love to shoot S5 recently at ISO 5,000. And at ISO 5,000, I would say I'm looking as clean as I would at normal 800. It's incredible. Uh, gives you just a ability for two different circuits to give you a difference in dynamic range improvement when you're in those higher ISOs, as well as much lower noise. And uh, depending upon which picture profile, that actually creates and tells you what the points are where it makes a change. It's not always those ISOs. So if you notice down this below is, the slide. This is, this is why I take out the S-Series camera. This is, this is, if, I, if I'm shooting out in the daylight like today, it's a nice day, I'll take the G or the LX uh, 10 or 100. But the reason I'll take the S out is I shot this picture in a very dark museum in Hood River, Oregon. If you've ever been to the Wham Museum, it is dark in there. And the nice thing about it is I can go up to an ISO of like 12,800 and I didn't need to go to that high ISO to shoot, but I also wanted depth of field. I wanted to be able to stop down to F11 for this picture. And look at, you can read all the gauges on the dashboard, uh, the Catalina, the fuzzy dice are fuzzy. Uh, so if, if I'm gonna use the S-Series camera, and again, in Seattle and Portland, um, unfortunately, I hate to remind everybody, the days are getting a lot shorter and, and in November, they're gonna get really short. And when I go out at night, I like to do night photography. I'll always grab the S series for this reason. This is to me, the primary reason is, is uh, low light sensitivity. But I'll just add one step. That low light sensitivity is not just for the S series. You can look at GH5S. It's only a 10 megapixel camera. It has the same sensor size as GH5. So GH5S gives you that same dual native ISO. Of course, you're gonna get lower noise in a full frame sensor, but you have some of that same features uh, in GH5S. So here we are, uh, this is S1, or sorry, S5, shot at ISO 5000 using the uh, L monochrome D picture profile. I like to shoot a lot of black and whites. That is my favorite choice. So I use picture profile L monochrome D, which mimics Tri-X film, and this is ISO 5000. Amazing, amazing low light. And then well, here we are again at 5000. This is the new, um, the new front tower at the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences in Los Angeles. They just finished this kind of uh, mosaic on the front with these little tiny 24 karat gold tiles. And the image on the big image in the middle there uh, is the wide image shot with a 16 to 35 at F4, ISO 5000. And then I just took the same image and cropped it up for you just to show you how there is absolutely no noise in that 5000 ISO image and how sharp and detailed what I'm getting with an S5 24 megapixel sensor. It's just beautiful. Again, reasons why I grab full frame when I can. Again, just lit with those little bit of light underneath that building. The rest of the illumination 
is just street lights. So it's pretty dark. Uh, and I'm shooting ISO 5000 at F4, 16 to 35 on an S5. Picture profile. Yeah, I, think the, yeah, I think the S5 is, is unmatched for its high ISO capability. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Look at this, the detail down in the bottom there because of the dynamic range. Yeah. So if you look at the gentleman under the light in his white shirt, he stands out pretty good, but we're holding the white, we're holding the light up on top. But take a look at the lady sitting in the chair to the far left. I mean, she's deep in the shadows. This is straight out of camera. I have not done any shadow opening. I've not done any highlight manipulation. Uh, I like to show my images when I'm showing them to customers that this is kind of what came right out of the camera. I can always improve it, but look at how we've got just all that detail on the bright white on that gentleman's shirt. We've even got detail in the bright white and those metal sails on the kind of design work above him. And then in the deep, deep shadow, you can see she's sitting on a chair and I don't know if she's playing cards or doing something. There's a stroller there. I mean, it's just incredible what kind of dynamic range we can get at ISO 5000. Same thing here. This is beautiful. Yeah. Holds the colors. Again, shooting at ISO. Sharpness, resolution. Yeah. And this is only a 24 megapixel sensor. Amazing, amazing resolution. Low light beast. I want to make sure we're, we're getting close on time here. And I want to make sure we get to uh, some of these features we really love. Well, here's Hyperlap. So this is taking the S5, putting on a small tripod, putting it on my uh, dashboard of my car, setting it on the new slow and quick mode, and letting it go and creating what's called a hyperlapse. So if you guys yeah. can see the hyperlapse video, if you have it, here we go. Hyperlapse, yep. a time lapse where you actually move through the image. Now, this was during the fires that we had down here in Southern California, so it would be so much better with a great light blue sky. But again, it, it's, it's built into the camera. So you, you basically, instead of doing slow motion, you're going to four frames a second, you're doing fast motion. And again, this is only on this camera and the G100, which um, again, I, sh I, I use that because I've even put it on my bicycle because the, uh, the G100 is so light, I would never put the S5 on my bicycle. So, but, uh, but this is just a really, uh, these are just some of the unique features of Panasonic cameras. Yep. Whoops, I didn't, sorry, I didn't mean to start the video there. I'm trying to get to the, trying to get to the next frame. So this is, uh, I think this is our last topic, but this is a fun one. Yeah. So this is, yeah, this is our last one. This is live composite mode. This is available on, uh, let's see. Uh, the G95, 90. the G100, and the S5. Mm -hmm. These, the images that I'm going to show you in a minute were shot with the S5. And what this does is allows you to take a... Um, image it's sort of like a time it's sort of like a uh, not a time lapse but a long exposure um yeah. notice on the image on the left that is a typical time exposure you're opening the lens it's building up the exposure the whole time you have the lens opening and giving you that kind of you can notice this the light pollution is now building up and showing you and blowing out your stars that you want to see the image on the right is using live composite mode and what it does is it records the first frame then it records everything after the first frame, but only where light has changed. So anything that's changed from that first frame, it will then completely build up a new image, adding each frame as it goes along, but not building up the entire frame, just those things that change. So this is amazing for light painting. This is amazing for uh, traffic lights as you're shooting. Uh, if you're doing kind of a downtown LA scene, we've got some images that I can show you. Uh, it's, it's really fantastic. And you can see what you're getting. And that's the beauty of it. So here on the left, I have the image as it was normally shot. I set my exposure for the skyline. And you can see, even though it's a long exposure, there's not much traffic light going through. Now, if I use live composite mode on the right and I leave it open, it's now recorded that skyline for me, kept that as frame one, and now allows all those traffic lights as they go to build on the image. And you can literally see that on the back of the camera. And then all you do when you see when it's finished, what you think is what you've got. When you finish with what you've got and you think it's what you're visualized, in other words, it's built, it's built, it's built, and you see now an image that you like, touch the button and it will stop. And it will save that combined image as one simple image. Again, these images are straight out of camera, not manipulated. And that, that's what I love about it is in a, in a long exposure, you don't get to see your picture till the end. And in this, you're watching it build on the screen on the back, 
And literally when it's where you want it, you just tap the shutter button and, and it comes out exactly like it looked on the back of the camera. Here's another great one. This is a lot, yeah, go ahead, you did this. This is my truck. I took it out on the parking lot uh, across the street from my house while the lights were out. And so I grabbed my light stick, which is an LED kind of lightsaber wand like thing. I'm sure you can get them at Glazers. And I worked all along the car, first along the uh, horizontally, along the kind of line of the car where the handles are. Then I worked lower on the body panel. Then I worked across the front on the grill. Then I worked over the hood. Then I worked over the top where the rail is, where the, the roof rack. Then I worked on that far A pillar. And then I worked on the rims and the tires. Now I did the rims and the tires with a flashlight and I did the rest of it with a light stick. The beauty of this with the light stick was I could actually paint all that chrome on the grill and work my way across. And as it builds, you can literally see it go from left to right. Amazing, amazing, fun image. And then I by, showed- by, flipping around, by flipping around the articulating monitor, the LCD, you were able to watch this as you did it and, and see when you had painted the whole car. I cheated even further. I used a seven inch Atomos monitor on top and flipped it around. And yes, I could see what I was doing as I was working. I'll be honest exactly. with you, this took about 38 minutes for me to do. And it was about my fourth or fifth try. I kept getting in the shot. <laughs> that one's beautiful. I love that. Same thing with this. This is a light painting. Yeah. Again, light painting, uh, just black background using a flashlight to paint in the uh, calyx of the flowers. And then light stick from the top, a little bit of blue light from the left-hand side, just to give you that little bit of kind of change in color. Uh, beauty of this is just being able to use light from many different directions to give you that depth and shadow rather than just flat lighting everything. So if I want light from both left and right, I can do that. Lifeguard station here in Redondo Beach, pitch black. Uh, I needed a flashlight to even walk on the beach and just got up there with a light stick and painted it all up and took about 15 minutes. And then I turned the light stick from daylight to tungsten and painted the sand that nice warm yellow color. Just fun. One more thing we're gonna talk about, 96 megapixel high resolution mode, uh, the ability to shoot in JPEG and RAW, which is new with the S5. Uh, the S cameras do do that, but just in the RAW processing mode, S5 breaks out the new JPEG ability. And so now you have the ability of shooting RAW and JPEG and I'll show you kind of an example. This is an image of a building here in, in uh, Santa Ana with the uh, Apollo capsule out in front. And pay attention to the rivets and those little squares on the bottom of the capsule. Uh, that first, the whole picture. yep, that first image there, that is the 90. Oh, this one? Nope. This one? Keep going. That one there, that's 96 megapixels. Gotcha. This okay. one is now the regular 24 megapixel. So you can tell it to shoot that. And now you can see the difference between the 96 megapixel in the back and the 24 megapixel in the front. Just so much more detail. You probably can't see it online. It's probably broken apart. But if you were to see those two images next to each other, amazing, amazing detail. And I'm going to add one more thing. This is another one of Mike's challenges. Most people tell you that if you're using uh, the high res mode, which is stepping the sensor, taking eight different images and putting it together, because of it's taking time, you are to put it on a tripod. Well, we have a mode one and a mode two. Mode two is if you have like moving water, moving leaves, and it will take the low res and the high res and combine them for anything that moves. Well, the beauty of this is I took this handheld. So I handheld this, shot 96 megapixel on mode two and got amazing, amazing results. Now the, G, the G9 will also do this. It, it's an 80 megapixel picture, but um, it'll do this too. So we've got this in four thirds and we've got it in, uh, in, in full frame. S5. So, uh, yeah. So again, we've, we've hope we've, we've given you kind of a reason that, that, uh, you know, like myself, I shoot, uh, 90% G series or the LX series, but for low light situations, um, or light painting, I'll take out that, uh, the, the S5, especially now that it's the size of the G9 and, uh, and Michael's, I think given a good case for, for why the S series is better. And, uh, you know, I hope we've laid it out for you and, and let you know why both formats are there, why we make both formats. And um, now that we've gone to full frame, there's been people who've questioned whether we're committed to four thirds. And yes, we are. Um, there's new things in the works. There's there's a roadmap of things coming up. So, uh, so Kate, I know we ran a few minutes over. We sure appreciate your time. You're doing two classes with us today. 
Yeah, of course. Anytime you know I love you guys. Um, and we love you guys. So uh, that was super informational and covers a lot of the, the balance between the two. Um, and we'll give people information they need, too, because we get to keep this one up on our YouTube channel, I think. So maybe, yeah. possibly. Yeah. yeah, I hope so. We love the shot of the car. That was a great shot of your oh, yeah. car. Yeah, we were like, oh, that's that was really beautiful. awesome. Yeah, love to play around with light painting. Um, do that a lot during. I think it'd be, I think it'd be great in the in the rain. You know, when it's not raining, but the water's still on the ground, like at oh, yeah. uh, Pike's Market. Wouldn't yeah, it? nope. I do that every year. I take a group normally yeah. to Pike Place Market when it's all decked out for yeah. holidays as well. So there's extra oh, lights yeah. and that kind of thing. And if it's rain, if you could throw I'm a little, like throw a little awesome. extra light in. Yep. Yeah, nice and I have been trip. known. I have been known to have people with me who will put water on the ground. <laughs> yeah, but pretty pretty soon you won't have to worry about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. But we've totally done that. Um, not just at Pike Place Market, but also at the waterfront where the big wheel, where the great wheel is. But, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So yeah, so we're a little bit over time. Um, we I, we've had a very quiet bunch with us again today. So there actually haven't been any questions or anything. So with that in mind, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, just okay. uh, first of all, thank you, Mark and Michael, for all of that information. Um, when we do wrap, just pop, stay on the Zoom call super quick so we can just have a quick last couple of questions just with us. Um, but for those of you tuning in, uh, again, lots of promos are ending today. So please come into the store, give the store a call, or check your email for those promotions. Take advantage of them because there's a lot of things that we've been talking about this week that all end today. So don't miss those promotions. Um, this anniversary is not even over yet. We still have a full two more weeks of content happening. Ooh. And this week is gonna get crazy. Let me tell you, we have programming six of seven days this coming week. I told myself going into this that we would not do that. And then I did it anyway. So uh, as we wrap up lighting and Panasonic week, we are gonna, Go right into lenses week. So we have some ambassadors from three different lens companies who will be doing presentations. Um, and then as we get towards the you know, end of the week, we'll have some other camera company uh, who we feature next weekend. So everybody gets a turn basically, um, which is part of why we did this the way that we did. So and tons of programming, go to glazerscamera.com backslash anniversary, check out the schedule, it's all free. Uh, many of it, much of it will be available on our YouTube to watch post the live event, but some of it won't be. So if you're able to tune in when it's happening live, please do so, because again, that's also your opportunity to ask questions of those people who are leading uh, those, live those live sessions. So anyhow, I'm gonna go get another cup of coffee because I obviously it's time for afternoon <laughs> coffee. Uh, and uh, Mark, <laughs> Michael, too can many I, M's today. I, oh my can God. I plug our, yeah. Go ahead. Can I plug our class real quick on October 24th? Oh, yeah, 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 if yeah, I remember. Yeah. I totally, how did hey, I forget I'll that? I'll be, I'll be back and Michael will hopefully be back with me and you'll be here. I don't know yes. about Devin, but you know. <laughs> I don't know. I think so. Yeah, so we are doing, I'm going to pull it up here so I can have the exact date for you guys. So uh, Mark is going to be doing his like Lumix Basics session in just a few weeks, actually, on October 24th. Um, and that session is 50 bucks or it's free if you buy your Lumix camera at Glazers. So it's kind of like a bonus little thing. And this is like how to get started with uh, your new Lumix camera or maybe you've had it for a while and you want to get d deeper into it um, because Mark will go into it with like some slides and things like that. But a lot of times he just kind of opens the floor for questions too. So, um, so we'll be back with him on October 24th. Um, Mark, did you okay. have anything else you wanted to add to that? No, nope, that's it. No, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> okay. Uh, we got some thank folks you, who are tuning in. Do say thank you to you guys for all of that information. Um, and with all that said, I'm going to let everybody go. Uh, go out, take some photos with all of your new information or buy that new camera that you've been thinking about getting, you know, or both. One of those two things. So, uh, Mark, Michael, thank you so much. Everybody else, have a great day. Okay, thank you, Kate.